Well, we're going to talk about something that I think all of us really need to have a good handle on because we are swamped with this kind of woke moralist out there. And really behind it, even though it's very aggressive, is relativism of all things. And in fact, this is a new brand of relativism called the new relativism. And that's why I want to talk about with my friend, Carlo Broussard. Welcome back to Hands On Apologetics. Gary, it's great to be back with you, my friend. Thanks for having me in the dojo. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this book that you wrote really is a full plate of a lot of goodies. I mean, you break this new uh, relativism down. You know, we've talked about the, like total relativism, moral relativism. And today we're going to talk about cultural relativism. Yeah. And uh, yeah, why don't you start by maybe you could define what exactly do you mean by cultural relativism? Yeah, well, cultural relativism is contrasted by some scholars with what some will say an individual form of relativism. So an individual form of relativism would be there's no absolute truth independent of what I say or I think or I perceive. So truth is relative to my individual judgment. Mm -hmm. In contrast, cultural relativism similarly will say there is no absolute truth. But where it differs is in saying there is no absolute truth independent of what the group judges to be true or what a collection of individuals consent to be true. So truth would be relative to what the group of individuals happens to think. That group of in individuals could be a culture, a society. And this is where it gets a little bit fuzzy within cultural relativism because couldn't it be just maybe a collection of individuals within that society and maybe they determine what is true for them as opposed to some other collection of individuals within that broader culture or society, right? So that's one of the problems that begins to already manifest itself when you begin to think about cultural or society says – Relativism. I like that label that, that Beckwith and Kolkel ascribe to it in their book, Feet Firmly Planted in Mid Air. They contrast individual relativism with cultural relativism with the labels of I say relativism, individual relativism, and society says relativism or cultural relativism. The bottom line being that there is no absolute truth independent of what a group or collection of individuals happens to think and what they consent on. And so that's maybe a short way of uh, describing cultural relativism, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so it's it, because I always think of relativism as being highly individualistic. Yeah. Right. Where cultural relativism is collective. Yeah, that's an interesting thought and uh, and a little disarming, too, because it, it you have to I imagine you have to approach both of them very differently. Right. If, if well, there are some similar tactics in approaching it. So we have to ask the question, does it pass its own test? So if we're talking about individual relativism or I say relativism, let's just say in its total form, right? Because that's where it's going to be self-contradictory. Saying there is no absolute truth uh, independent of what a particular group of people happens to think and have a consensus about. Well, the question becomes, is that claim itself, does that claim itself transcend all cultures, all groups of people? If you say it does, well, then there's at least one absolute truth that is not dependent on a particular group of people and what they think and what their consensus is, in which case cultural relativism would be false, right? Right. But if they say, no, it is relatively true, if the claim there is no absolute truth independent of a culture or a society, if one wants to say that is only relative to a particular group of people, well, then the you have – that's not an absolute truth, in which case it has no bearing on reality, in which case there's no reason why I ought to conform my mind to it and assent to it because that would be a claim that's true simply relative to the culture or a particular group of people. And so it re is reduced to a mere taste or preference of a culture that just might so happen to be different than another culture and their taste or preference, but it actually has no bearing on reality, in which case we ought not to give much concern or consideration for it. Carlo, you know, someone could say, since we're on the topic of consent, well, ultimately, 
as long as the other person consenting, there really is no harm done. I mean, mm. and if there is harm, they, they're they consenting to the harm. But, you know, it, it's almost as if our moral actions are uh, somehow segregated from the rest of society. But, you know, ac- the actions of individuals also affects, you know, what society will tolerate. And, you know, it affects everybody, really. Yeah, there is no such thing as private morality. I mean, there are things that we do in the privacy of our own homes that can be judged whether they're good or bad given our human nature. But there's no such thing as a human action done in private that is not in some way going to spill over into human society, right, and affect others. Why? Because what we do determines our character. It's going to determine the way we think. It's going to determine the way we react to certain triggers and and emotional uh, emotions when certain emotions are aroused within us caused by other people, right? Whether that be anger or the, you know, the desire of, of the sexual appetite, What we do in the privacy of our own home is a training ground for how to behave as a human being. And so if we train ourselves to behave in a certain way as a human being, even within the privacy of our own home, guess what? When you step out the privacy of your own home and you begin interacting with other human beings within society, you're playing the human ball game, right? And so you're naturally going to engage in human interpersonal relationship based on and how you've been training yourself to to behave and so there's no individual human action within the privacy of your own home that's not in some way going to affect you such that when you step out of the home and engage in interpersonal relationship is not going to affect that relationship you know it's, it's part of the human condition we we think that you know when we sin god isn't doesn't know you know <laughs> we're right. like kind of like adam in the garden you know yeah. god's god's away so the cat will play. Yeah. But, you, you know, there was another thought, too. I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, no, go ahead. You had mentioned, you know, uh, uh, as long as it's not harming someone, right? Yeah. Um, and we have to always ask the question, well, what do you mean by harm? Because if you're restricting harm to physical harm, well, then it's true. You might be able to engage in some human behavior that does not bring about physical harm in another human being. But that really just begs the question against the classical natural law theorists, right? And the Christian fundamentally, but even if not Christian, a philosopher or a right thinking human being who's basing, basing his moral philosophy on the natural moral law, because if a certain human behavior is contrary to what's truly good for us insofar as we're a human being. And that would say it would, you know, conflict with the natural moral law. Well, then it would be harmful, maybe not physically, but it would be harmful to one's moral character. It would be harmful to the human being in acting contrary to that which makes the human being human, namely his reason. To act contrary to reason is the most undignified thing that we could possibly do because we're acting against the very thing that makes us human. And so one becomes less than the brute, as St. Thomas Aquinas says. That's harmful. It doesn't bring about physical harm necessarily, but it's harmful to one's moral character because one is acting contrary to his or her dignity, acting contrary to reason. So if that moral framework is correct and certain human behaviors, same say same-sex sexual activity, if that's immoral, Well, engaging in that activity would be harmful to the people involved because it's morally harmful, even though maybe not physically harmful.